Let's rise up to pray together. Let's pray that the Lord God will speak to us in this message. And the Lord God will open our eyes to see, see those things that we see how to see. Let's pray that by the grace of God, all that we've been learning since we came here will be fruitful in our lives. And all the expectations that this church has of us and all the expectations that our Father and the Lord is praying to see in our lives will come to pass. That this new year, by the grace of God, will march forward and will not do things as we did them in the years gone by. Pray God we open our eyes and help us to obey and to do his will. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Almighty Father, we're very grateful this day. Thank you so much for all your goodness and mercies. Thank you for bringing us to this kind of church. Thank you, Lord, for how you started a church that believes on the totality of the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the man you give to us, to this generation, and to all the nations of our own time. Thank you for the truths we've heard. Thank you for all the trainings we've received. We glorify your name, Lord, and we pray that all these trainings and all these expositions and all these corrections, Lord, will bear fruit in our lives in Jesus' name. This is the new year, Lord, and this is a Congress where we are about to be repositioned to move forward. Holy Father, we pray that we will do exactly what your spirit says we should do in Jesus' name. Lord, here is another message coming to us as put down, O Lord, in the word of God and as arranged by your servant. Holy Father, we pray that we will hear nothing but your word and the atmosphere here, O Lord, be pervaded with your sobriety, with your gentleness, with your humility, and with your spirit in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, that you strengthen every one of us to be attentive to your word and to pray in all the things that your spirit will say to the church. Thank you, Father, because you are in control. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Let's give a louder amen. amen. We may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We come to this important message which I believe by the grace of God is put in this program to consolidate the gains of all, all our efforts in evangelism. The first night we came to this program, our Father and the Lord made us understand that this program, the Congress, the theme is dawn. And he gave us explanation, the meaning of that word, the acronym dawn discipling a whole nation and if we are going to practice practice that if we are going to put that into operation and actualize it then what we're about to look at now is very important here we find the title practical strategies in saturation church planting practical strategies in saturation church planting and as we examine this subject of church planting, we shall plunge into the scriptures to find biblical justification for the church's current apostolic drive on evangelism and church planting. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. They will see the great commandment. And we're going to link that up with the great commission. Genesis 1.28 says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. This is divine agenda. This is the will of God in the beginning. 
God has stated his agenda here to fill the whole earth with godly seed, pure rays that will radiate his flawless glory and royal majesty of excellence. But in chapter 3, there was a disaster. Chapter 3 of Genesis, there was a place where the devil tempted Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve fell into sin. And by falling into sin, they scuttled the will of God. They scuttled the plan. But God Almighty had another plan. He had a plan B. And so in chapter 3, in verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's God's plan B. God is saying, all right, looks like now my plan to populate the whole earth with godly seed through Adam and Eve had been somehow contaminated by the fall into sin of the two, the first couple. And God said, I'm going to go it through another way. I'm going to achieve my aim through another route. I'll send the seed of the woman who will come and terminate the agenda of the devil and actualize my own agenda. So God Almighty began to work on this agenda as we see in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. The seed of the woman was about to be born. And so the prophecy came after the angel of the Lord had appeared to Mary. Matthew chapter 1, 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. From Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, and Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, when this prophecy was restated by God, we have a gap. This gap, the waiting period, when God was working out his agenda. Look through Noah, then through Abraham, and then eventually Jesus Christ, our Lord, was born. And this is shown in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what the Lord Jesus Christ actually came to do to fulfill the agenda in the beginning. 1 Corinthians, please, let's look at chapter 1, verse 15. 1 Corinthians. Sorry, uh, yes, chapter 15, sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's read verse 2. 15 verse 2 says, By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. The Lord Jesus Christ brought the salvation that we need. And when, when he brought the salvation, he sort of destroyed the works of darkness, the works of the devil. And so in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 is reported there that the Lord Jesus Christ came to restitute, to bring back what was lost. Colossians, please, uh, chapter 1 verse 22. Colossians chapter 1 verse 22. Verse 22 says, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his glory. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Chapter 1 verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. Jesus Christ, the firstborn of every creature. In verse 18 and verse 19 says, and he is the head of of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now, if you look further down to verse 19, it says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, all the fullness at the creation that was uh, terminated because of sin of Adam and Eve. The Lord God brought everything back through the Lord Jesus Christ. As the scripture says, in Adam all men died, but in Christ shall all men be made alive. Say amen. amen. So all men became alive through the Lord Jesus Christ's death. But then, even though all men became, uh, became alive, God Almighty wanted to continue his agenda by populating the whole earth 
with saints, with godly seed, through Jesus Christ, its only begotten Son. So, in Matthew 28, we have the great commission stated there. And the Lord Jesus Christ had something there to tell us. In Matthew 28, let's look at verse 19. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Verse 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Here now we see the Lord Jesus Christ giving the command that we should go to the whole world and preach the good news. Why? Teach the whole all nations. That means make disciples in all nations. What did the Lord Jesus Christ mean by that statement? What did he want to achieve? The Lord Jesus Christ came to work for our salvation. He finished the work of our salvation, but did not finish the work of evangelism. He died. He was raised up on the third day by the strength power of the Holy Spirit and he went to heaven. Because the Lord Jesus Christ could not finish the work of evangelism. He didn't travel all over the world that time. He only came primarily to save mankind. He handed over the work of evangelism to the church. To the disciples to go and finish up the assignment that is given to them. The same thing is said in Mark 16, 15. When it says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's another way of restating Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. Now in John 20, 21, the Lord Jesus Christ was talking to his uh, disciples there after his resurrection. And he said, peace be unto you. As my father had sent me, so sent I you. My father sent me to go and evangelize, to go and save the whole world. I'm sending you in the same capacity. You are not to save the whole world by dying for them. You are to save the whole world by preaching the good news to them. You are not sent to go and die on the cross to save humanity, but to ascend to go and suffer and preach the good news to draw them out of darkness into God's marvelous light. As my father had sent me, so sent I. I'm just trying to establish the biblical basis for church planting. And in Matthew chapter 21, Matthew 21, verse 41. So we can understand as a church that we are not on ego trip. We are not out to prove a point. We are not out to compete with any other ministry. And our Father and the Lord's vision is not vision of competition. It's a vision to fulfill the great commission. Look at Matthew 21 and let's look at verse 41. Matthew 21 verse 41 up to verse 43 says, Then they say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, we shall render him the fruits in their season. That's a proverb of the wicked husband man. And Jesus Christ said unto them, Did he never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected the same is become the head of the corner? That this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. The kingdom of God shall be taken from the Jews because they rejected Jesus Christ. And so we give that kingdom to a nation that will bear the fruit. That nation, is it Ghanaian nation? Is it Nigeria? Is it Cambodia? Is it Mozambique? No, 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 no. He's not talking about nation now in terms of geographical location. The Lord Jesus Christ here is emphasizing that the gospel, the fruit of the kingdom, will be, born, will be born by the church. In other words, the church is the nation. The church, the assemblage of believers, We now carry on the kingdom work and bear the fruit of evangelism, of soul winning, of new life, and spread from there to all over the whole world, raising godly seed according to God's plan and purpose. So, it is through Christ that God plans to recover the losses of Adam and restore all things. It is high time, therefore, that the church rose up 
to this challenge lest we fail the Lord as the first Adam did. If we would effectively and fruitfully evangelize the world, we must plant churches to mature the converts and make them fruit-bearing disciples. Jeremiah chapter 48 verse 10 says, Jeremiah 48 verse 10, Woe unto that man that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. We are not just getting involved in some kind of church planting without order. Church planting without uh, purpose. Church planting without sense of direction. Oh, we are going to plant church, so let's just plant church anyhow. If you do that, we may uh, incur the wrath of God. We have been sent out from this church as from today to go out, preach the gospel, get the converts, disciple them, and plant churches everywhere. Churches that will grow, that will multiply, and that will prepare souls for eternity with Christ. The Lord God will help us to do this in Jesus' name. But then there are problems, brothers and sisters. There are problems uh, that we face in terms of uh, trying to plant uh, uh, churches. We have some problems that try to obstruct church planting efforts. Time will fail me to dig down into all these problems. I'm just going to itemize them. Number one, misconstruction. The problem of misconstruction, that's misunderstanding of the divine purpose of church planting. Misconstruction number two, the problem of misconception. Misconception. We, we might be reluctant to plant new churches if our idea of how to evangelize the world is scripturally wrong. We are thinking that, well, what, uh, what's, uh, what's the problem now? After all now, we have, uh, we have a big church and so long our mega church sparkles with holistic growth. Then we may not need to plan churches anymore. But the world can be discipled in one local church. And the Lord says, teach all nations. Preach the gospel to every creature. And it says, as the Father sent me, so send I you. So don't forget that the apostles also had this kind of problem before their sanctification. When they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, three of them, Peter, James, and John, and the Lord Jesus Christ, then Jesus Christ was transfigured before them. Moses appeared, and then Elijah appeared, and Peter said, it's good for us to stay here. Just build three tents, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. But there are, there are other people at the, below the mountain, at the foot of the mountain. We still have other uh, nine apostles waiting and so many other villages the Lord Jesus Christ was yet to preach. But these people were just satisfied because they saw the glory of the Lord. Are we not so satisfied also because we see the size of the church, the way it is all over the world and the holiness, the righteousness, the correction, the, the, the miracles, the signs and wonders, the glory of the Lord that pervades the church from coast to coast. We might be tempted to say, well, okay, we have a good church and have a great man of God, our Father in the Lord, and we are well fed. Who cares if others perish outside? That will not be the will of God, and that should not be our mindset. Number, number three, problem of misperception. The problem of misperception. The Lord Jesus Christ told them in John chapter 4 verse 35. John chapter 4 verse 35. Say ye not that it's just one more time the harvest will come. Lift up your eyes and see the feed already wide for others. So, some of us feel that, well, we may not, we don't have to work too much now. After all, by the grace of God, we have so many members in our church. Nigeria alone has one million members. And then all over Africa, we have tens of thousands of people. So, why the rush? Why the push? But we have to remember, this is misperception because, you see, we still have nearly one billion Muslims in the world. Not only that, we have nearly 1 billion Hindus in the world. We have about 600 million Buddhists in the world. And the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, and other Oriental religious, or these cultic religions, have more members than Deep Alive Bible Church. And so we can't just sit down and cool it off now. We have to move on because we have the word of life and make sure that we disciple all nations. Number four, mismanagement. Problem of mismanagement. We fear that new churches will be mismanaged by new leaders appointed to run them. Acts 17 verse 18 has something to say there when the Lord, when um, Paul the apostle was at Athens and was trying to preach. The philosophers were saying, were saying, what will this babbler say? 
What will this babbler say? And that babbler that you are calling a babbler was the servant of the Lord saying inside him was the great, great, great anointing to do the will of God. First Samuel chapter 17, First Samuel chapter 17, verse 32 to verse 37. First Samuel 17, 32 to 37 talked about David coming to the battlefield and found the bragging Goliath making just threaten everybody and nobody had strength to face him. And this man, this gentle, this young person about 70 years old came around and said, allow me to face this man, bring him down. And Saul said, you can't fight this man because he's been a warrior since his youth. But he didn't know what was locked in the belly, in the heart of that young looking delicate boy. He had killed a lion in the backside of the desert. He had killed a bear and he said, this uncircumcised Philistine will also fall like one of those uh, animals. Let's understand that those who are thinking can spoil the church may not spoil the church. Give it to them. They are going to hold the church in Jesus name. Somebody has been in our church for seven years, for six years and they are still not doing anything born again not committing sin but you are saying we can't trust him with location church we can't trust him with that new church six years in deep all bible church is a lot somebody who's in this church you will have taken how many now 56 bible study in one year times five apart from retreats about 12 retreats you will have taken consecrated messages swallow them eating them get fat in the spirit that person, if he goes to another church, is a bishop. But now we will say, no, 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 it's just to see you Let's see, allow that person to, uh, we, we can, we have no worker now. We have workers. We have men who are sitting down, women who are sitting down, and we think that they can't do it with all this anointing, all this injection of the Holy Spirit. I believe in God. They will do wonders in Jesus' name. And as we go back to our different locations and stations, and we transfer what was uploaded into us here, and we go there to download the same thing to them, and then we bless the name of the Lord for them, we pray for them, we train them, let them go. We will see wonders from their hands in Jesus' name. Then we see number five, the problem of misapplication. Misapplication. As we see in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, and the Acts chapter 11, verse uh, 1 to 3. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Misapplication. The Great Commission is misapplied to mean the preaching of the gospel and raising of churches in areas of high population density and human traffic. But that's not so because Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, the Lord Jesus Christ was going about preaching, going about the villages and cities and towns, preaching in the, in the, in the, in the, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, teaching in their synagogues, and healing all manner of sicknesses. He went to the village, he went to the town, he went to the city. We should understand therefore that what we are coming here to do, and we are going here to do, is to learn and to practice church planting that we take over the whole nation. Everywhere human being can be found, we shall plant churches there in Jesus' name. When we say saturation, saturation, church planting, we are meaning soaking the locality, the neighborhood with churches. And somebody said, one church for 1,000 people, at least one church to 1,000 people, soaking. There is no space for the devil to stay because all spaces are occupied by churches of Christ. We mean Bible-based church. Number six, the problem of misappropriation. The problem is of appropriation. Matthew 23, 23. Matthew 23, 23. The Lord Jesus Christ there talked about uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees. And we are not Sadducees and Pharisees who do not balance the scriptures. He said they were collecting the, the tithe of coming and the tithe of anish, but they forgot, they forgot the weightier matters. And in all our regions and states, we have to get a slice of the budget for church planting. We have the money to buy lands, we have the money to build, to furnish houses, to buy cars and so on, making the work moving faster. That's all right. But what about church planting? We must remember that you are going to be guilty of misappropriation if we don't set aside part of the budget to plant churches this year. We shall do it in Jesus' name. And finally, number seven, mistrust. 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 We don't have full trust in the workforce, as I said before. And because of this, now we are not, uh, we are not 
ready to commit anything to the hands of the workers. But now we are changing and everything will be all right in Jesus' name. And look at the message. Another three points. Point number one. Principles of and steps to saturation church planting. Principles of and steps to saturation church planting. Principles of and steps to saturation church planting. I want us to understand by the grace of God that the global pathing and spreading of living churches that our Father and the Lord has been training us to go and do, to go and actualize, follow certain principles. We cannot just go out and start planting churches anyhow. We must understand the principles. We must understand the steps. We must know how to apply them. So let's look at the principle. Number one, the principle first. The, pu the purpose must be right. The purpose must be right. That's the first principle. Why are we going to plant churches? Let's have the purpose right. We're not planting churches to compete with other ministries. We're not planting churches so we can impress ourselves. We are planting churches because we have a great commission from the great master. And as backed up by a servant, we go out in that, under that conviction and persuasion. Matthew 28, 19, again, very popular scriptures. We have to read it. That's a strength of church planting. It says, go ye therefore, let's finish it, and teach all nations. Teach all nations means make disciples of all nations nations make disciples of all nations that's the reason why we are going baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you that's it we're going out to make disciples of all nations not only to make disciples now to ensure that these disciples abide in the lord and they themselves become reproducible disciples look at john chapter 15 verse 16 the lord jesus christ talking here john 15 16 says ye have not chosen me but i have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the father in my name he may give it you let's say amen to that the fruit of evangelism, the converts, the Lord Jesus Christ says, they must abide. If we preach and the converts are not abiding, then the will of the Lord has not been done. And there's no way these converts can abide unless we church them. We bring them into fellowship and we do the will of God. In so the purpose must be right. Number two, the people must be right. The people must be right. We have to use the right people to do church planting. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 2. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 2. We have to commit these things to faithful men who can help us to teach others also. Second Timothy 2 to says, and the things that thou hast heard of me, the things we've heard from daddy here for all these days, and all the trainings, and all the lectures, and all the exhortations, and all the rebukes, and all the power, and all the illuminations, among many witnesses, many witnesses are here today, the angels are also here, even though we don't see them, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also the people must be right we don't commit this kind of job to dissident in the church people who don't have the mind of christ we don't give them we don't send them to the battlefield we have been told the first night that we should not tolerate we should detest every all acts of negligence we should not allow such people to lead this kind of divine agenda that the lord god is giving to the church at this time number three the place also must be right the place must be right. No time for me to read many scriptures, but look at this point carefully. When we say go and plant churches by the grace of God, our, in, our idea is we are going to plant church, um, so we need land, we need to buy plots of land, and we need money. You say what? Uh, some people will come to me and they say, I say, they say, do we need? We have found a plot of land. How much is it? Say, Four million naira. Three million a plot and when we're buying that plot of land now then we have to erect the building and while we're doing all that sourcing for fund and praying for fund time is wasted and so we should get idea of the kind of church 
We are told to plant. We are not planting cathedrals. Please. The early church did not spread that way. Look at it closely. You know, the place, you have to discard the idea that church buildings are essential. Well, buildings are okay. The quarters should be beautiful. That's at Jerusalem. But when we are planting, churches are multiplying discipleship centers for the old nations. We're not going to think in terms of cathedral. You go to a village, even the king's palace is built with thatched leaves. And then you want to put a cathedral in the village. Have they seen such things before? Get, get people go together in a place that's conducive for learning, for teaching, for fellowship. Consider a start in homes or some rented apartments or mini halls or basement and garages owned by members. The Holy Church began in homes and from there they grew mightily. Acts chapter 2 verse 41. Acts chapter 2 verse 41. That's where they started and that's where they grew out. They grew together. They grew to affect to impact their society. Acts chapter 2. Let's look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received the, his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So what happened after that? And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then let's go on to uh, verse 46. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple. That was a temple. And breaking bread from where? House to house. House to house. House to house. That's different from cell churches, from cell groups, house fellowship. This is not house fellowship that hosts meetings in the evening. We, we're talking about churches in the homes. Some of us here, we have our parlors are big enough for children to play football. Well, they can play football, they can move around there. We have large space. And yet you are looking for plots of land to start a church. What about your parlor? Don't can't you become the obedient of your own time? Accepting the ark of the Lord into your house. We will do it in Jesus' name. And number four, the population must be right. The population must be right. Right for a new church. Nothing starts big that lasts. And big things have small beginnings. The Bible Bible Church that we see today, it almost become impossible for us now to know how many we are, began with only 15 members. And today it's so big, like the mustard seed. The smallest of us is sown to the ground up, becoming big tree, under which birds of air are found nests and found refuge. Let's start small. We've done the evangelistic outreaches by the grace of God and won some souls. Let's start with those souls. They might be 25, they might be 45. If we give them the mindset that they are to reproduce themselves, the church will not die in Jesus' name. And so we have these things to understand and apply. Let's not think that we have to start with large number of people. Because 94% of all churches in the world are reported to have membership less than 350. Consider that. Also, 60% of churches in the world are under 150 members. Consider that also. And 3% are comprised of less than 50 members. Small churches will grow. And the Lord God will bless the work of our hand in Jesus' name. Let me just summarize the major steps. Now, number one, we pray. Our Father and the Lord said so much about prayers today and we pray this morning. We pray. Number two, we plan. We make survey. We find out the place that the church is needed, not just slashing churches. We find out the area of need. We plan, number one. Number two, we pray. Because if you don't plan, then you can end up with frustration. We need to plan. Plan the cost. Ask yourself about the resources. And then we need to pray. Number three, preach the good news. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 to 24. We preach Christ crucified. That's the good news. And Luke 24, Luke 24, verse 46 and verse 47. That repentance and remission of sin should be preached. 
in all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So you can understand by the grace of God here that we have to preach the good news. And we shall preach the good news. Number three, when we preach and God gives us converts, we preserve. Preserve the converts in fellowship. Preserve them. Preserve them. Number four, after preservation, prepare the converts. Preserve, prepare the converts that dis disciple them. Begin the process of discipleship. And then number five, number six, promote. These disciples now, after the Lord God has helped you to, pro to produce them, then you promote them. You make them workers for God. They to start making disciples in their neighborhood. And number seven, perfect. Perfect the leadership. Those who are core group, those who are sent to preach the gospel should also come for retraining and retraining from time to time so that the vision of producing more churches can be kept alive. That's no time for me to develop all this. And so we summarize here these steps. Number one, develop a vision for it. A vision. Without vision, people perish. Another translation says the people cast off restraint and go wild. No control. Develop a vision of it. Number two, define church planting focus group. Define church planting focus group. You have to define the group the focus group after your survey, where am I going to? What are the peculiarities of this focus group? Define church planting focus group through survey, proper survey, and other people group investigation. Number three, determine the cost. Available resources and sources of funding. Determine the cost. And number three, delimit the outreach delimit the outreach. That means concentrate on unreached people group to plant the church. Put the church where it is needed. And then number five, declare the gospel using appropriate means. Declare the gospel. Number six, disciple the converts in the local church. Where the church is planted, that's the best place to disciple the converts. And number seven, deploy the disciples to evangelize, to evangelism fields, mobilizing the membership to reproduce themselves and back another church. By the grace of God, we will do this wherever the Lord will send us to in Jesus' name. I just run through point number two now quickly. Practical strategy. This is where the meat is. Practical strategies for saturation church planting. Practical strategies for saturation church planting as we said before church planting saturation church planting means soaking the environment with churches the neighborhood with churches and at least one church for 1000 people in proverbs chapter 4 verse 7 proverbs chapter 4 verse 7 says wisdom is a principal thing therefore get wisdom and with all thy getting get what understanding we need wisdom to do this that's why we come to strategies that's why uh, daddy has brought this to us so that we can understand how to go about it and in ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 15 ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 15 if we don't have the strategies what will happen to us it says in verse 15 the labor of the foolish we read every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to this city. You will know how to do it. will be confused. It will not be confused in Jesus name. And so brothers and sisters. And we talk about strategies now. Uh, I will just run through the strategies. But I want to say that some of these strategies. Are not applicable. To our context. But we need to know them for knowledge sake. After all who knows tomorrow. We might need them. But we should, look, we should look at all these strategies together. And there are so many of them in church planting literature. We'll just look at some of them and i give you the reference because of time constraint. Number one, the group. Group one, parenting model. Parenting models. Now, there you see Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 3. 
Acts 13, 1 to 3, that's in Antioch, where they were praying, and the Holy Ghost said, Separate Paul and Barnabas for me, for the church, I've said, uh, for the work I've said them to uh, call them for. And so, under this group one, we have A. A, offspring congregation design strategy. Offspring congregation design strategy. In other words, you are parenting the new church. It's the new church is your child. And under that A, write the following down. Number one, split cell-based church plant design. Split cell-based church. A cell church is split into two. And then we say one should go to that place that's necessary, that's needed. And then this should stay here. That's split cell-based church planting. And number, under that, okay, number two, mother-daughter based. Mother-daughter based. A district can start a church. And that district will continue to look after that church until it grows. You now, one of the Bible studies that it told us that you can contribute your 10%. Your 10% in your district, 10% of your workforce, we call that core group. To be sent to go and help you to plant that church and then they stay there until the church grows and matures and can stand on its own and then they can move on to other places 10 percent like that and so we call that mother daughter based you are going to see some overlappings in this models now number four under that number three mission strategy mission sorry mission sunday school based mission Sunday school based strategy. In other words, you can start a church in a location based on the call of Sunday school. We call it such a scripture. We just go there for Sunday school for Sunday scripture, but that is not going to be applicable to us. What can be applicable to us is Bible study location. We might start a Bible study location to plan the church. By the grace of God, that's mission-based strategy. And so, every Monday, we hook them up to the satellite. After preaching the gospel, not just starting Bible location, we are preaching the gospel, the converts are gathered together, then we follow the Bible study. And then they continue like that, like that, by the grace of God, and it starts growing. And from there, a church can emerge and be planted solid on the word of God. Number four, number four second generation-based second generation based that's the church planting strategy that talks about reaching the young ones and we have a rich youth ministry in deep Alive bible church and that ministry that arm can really do a lot to plan churches this year for the youths targeting them and bringing them into the church that's to be planted in area of their concentration now three under parenting models be be part of it be part of it. Satellite congregation design strategy. Satellite congregation design strategy. When we say satellite, we mean branch churches. We don't mean satellite transmission. Branch, uh, branch churches. Satellite congregation design strategy. New work units that either operate alongside the main church or break off and become self-supporting. We can split a church into two. And like I said, that's an overlapping now. One church will go there and start. And this mother church continues to monitor the growth of that church. Continues to monitor the operations of that church until that church can stand uh, firm. And under that satellite congregation, we have what is called multi-housing estate-based church. Multi-housing estate-based church. All these exits, uh, Yakubu Gowan estate, Jakande estate, and in all our cities we have estates, estates like that. We can plant a church there. That's estate-based. Because the people in that estate, they tend to live like a community. We can plant a church in that place and then watch over that church and the church will grow in Jesus' name. Then we have number three, house church. House church based house church based church planting design that's a church started in homes as i've told us before we can take off in our different homes when we have the large space enough and then by the grace of god we preach the gospel around the neighborhood we get the converts together and we start the church in 
outside the house. And by the grace of God, the church begins to grow from there. We know in the New Testament, we heard Paul the Apostle saluting people and saying, um, and greetings to the church in their house. He keeps saying that about two uh, scriptures there. I couldn't uh, read those things now. So let's understand that these are strategies by the grace of God by which we can plant new churches. Now come to number C. C. Revitalization, congregation design. That's a, a design that restart dead churches. Revitalization, congregation design, revitalize. That's a simple word. We we'll revitalize. That means we we'll raise it up again. It is dead before, and now it is raised up again. Many churches have been closed down. Is it true? Yes, we closed them down because they were not doing fine. We can go back to those churches and raise them up again. Those that should be raised up should be raised up. Some were misplanted in the beginning. Now we have to transplant them elsewhere. And some that died because we didn't take care of them, by the grace of God, we can raise them back to life. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. The Lord Jesus Christ says, Upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's not allow the gates of hell to prevail against our new churches. If any church has died, we can go out prayerfully, hold programs around that place, and by the grace of God, raise it back to life. And the churches will come back to life in Jesus' name. I come to number two, number two, number two of strategies, group two, pioneering models. Pioneering models. Pioneering models. That's the kind of model now whereby you are sent to a place to go and start something very new. In other words, there was no church there at all before. I was in a place in a very big city. I think the city has been evangelized, but it's not evangelized enough. And I, there was a particular environment, densely populated, very big. People were so many there, but there was not a single church. You can't believe that. I surveyed the place, not one church, and it's a city. Not even a false prophet church, nothing. And so when you look at that, and you think that city, as popular as it is, is evangelized, they've heard the gospel, but it's not true. They have not heard the gospel. We still need to do survey and see the area of need. So if you are sent there to go and pioneer or walk there, and there's some group of people are sent there to go, saturate the place with evangelism, do programs and pioneer and start something very new, then we call that pioneering models. It has many, many other subdivisions that we may not look at right now, but that's just the simple meaning of pioneering models. Now, number three, partnering models. Partnering models. Partnering models. Uh, these partnering models, as the name suggests, means partners from various ministries are coming together to form a team of church planters. Uh, that's not what we can practice because we are not too sure of whom the partners are and what they're up to. We're not sure of their doctrinal persuasions, but we can have our own version of that by bringing some men and women from a group of district and another man team from another group of district and they come together and they go out to plant a church in an area of need. We did that in 1996 by the grace of God. This cooperative rural evangelism away. And those of us who were there at that time, the Lord used that project mightily. That in just about a two or three months, close to 1,000 churches were planted in the villages. And they survived. But somehow along the line, uh, that project stopped. But the project will come back to life again. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Since now we are talking about saturation, church planting activities, villages, cities, towns, the whole nation will be discipled for Christ in Jesus' name. So brothers and sisters, partnering models we can do. And number four now, number four, propagating model. Propagating model. This is about continuous, aggressive multiplication of churches, aggressive multiplications of churches. In other words, we step up the church planting as society. We just step it up everywhere. 
As we are planting one, we are moving to another one, we are moving to another one, and that's exactly what we are required to do. Propagating model. Just doing it and planting it. After praying, after doing all we ought to do, after doing the program now, we plant the church there. We don't stay there. We don't say we are planted, this is where we are staying. We have a target for the year. And the target is at least every church should reproduce itself. So, we have been told everything will be doubled. Say amen. amen. We are going to multiply nations. We are going to multiply churches in Africa. We are going to double whatever is on ground now. We will be doubled by December in Jesus' name. Propagating model number five. People group model. This is very, very important. People group model. My time is slipping away, but I like to look at this closely. Matthew chapter 28. People group model. Matthew 28, let's read verse 19 again. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever have commanded you. Now, let me just stop there. By saying, make disciples of all nations, another translation says, ethno, all people groups. All people groups could be tribal people group. Could be linguistic that's language people group. Could be any, any set of people that could be identified by certain distinctive features. We call them people group. And so we have to look for people group also and then try to plant churches in their midst. Igbo forms people group. Yoruba forms people group. Ausa and so on, people group. The tailors, people group. The armed forces, people group. The policemen, people group. And so on and so forth. The area boys and area girls, people group. We have various kinds of people groups all over. If you sit down, you have a committee of church planters, and you study this, we can put churches that will satisfy the salvation needs of these people groups. I have a model here, like the demographic church planting. Demographic means according to their age. We can have age bracket of the people we like to reach, like the youths, like the or those who are old people. They also need church. We should prepare them for heaven. Then we have under that people group portable church based planting design. Portable church based planting design. Portable. That's a mobile church. Well, that is not here in, it's not common here, but in some other countries of the world, they do this where it's difficult for them to have a place to stay. Like in the United States of America, they have 24,000 or so mobile churches meeting rented apartments in basements and garages and so on and relocating as need arises. But let's focus on this. Do you know that these portable churches are reported to be impacting about 6 million people every weekend. Every weekend, they touch the lives of 6 million people. Portable churches, meeting everywhere. And if they meet here today for two to three weeks, and they need to relocate, they tell their members, we are relocating to another place. And they're getting people, and they're following them around. And they're impacting lives. We will do more than that in Jesus' name. Say it louder, Amen. There are other, other, other uh, parts of this that I can't uh, talk about now because my time is uh, uh, slipping away. We have college-based church planting. College-based church planting. We have very rich, deeper life campus fellowship that the Lord God has raised up over the years. We can plant churches in the camp. Uh, all these uh, campuses. We can plant churches in the campuses or in the surrounding of the campuses to take care of the population of the people inside the colleges to catch them. We have cross-cultural church planting design. Cross-cultural. Across culture. Across culture. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Number six. Program-based church planting strategy. Program-based. Program-based. Church planting strategies based on programs like our retreats. It could be used to plant churches. Women program. We can hold women program in that place. A prayer program. 
to evangelize a place we preach the gospel person to person we hold crusade there and then we call women out prayer walks and so on and get the converts our purpose is to preach the gospel and bring them to the lord jesus christ program based and you know that our church here is a church based on programs at the grace of god and we have flourished through that i want to say that recently december retreat we use that strategy that was a far place very very far uh, from their own region center there and they just wrote they requested for retreat location to be established uh, there and so we what, what, what's the justification I set up a committee and they looked at it and they, it was very uh, very important to give them a location why over the years the attendance at the regional headquarters retreat is about 300 or 400 members and yet, in their combined services, or one service they had, they said they had about 1,000 plus. So, what is that? Okay, so let's take permission. So, we permitted, and Daddy said, we can go ahead. Thank God, we went ahead. I tell you, they had attendance they've never had before. In fact, they, they started constructing toilets, I mean, real water system toilets. I got to the place, I saw the place fenced up, and you wonder where the money was coming from. This were just few people, rural area, money came, they were motivated, they were stirred up. And when the retreat ended, I said, how many of you did? They said, it were about 1,600. Imagine that. Imagine that. Put your hands together for Christ. This is what we're talking about. But if we lose, if we lose the focus of church planting, and we want to just bring people together, we are not too keen about decentralizing. Regions don't want to break into two. State don't want to go down and break into various parts. Then we'll be losing some grounds. But if you can bring the gospel nearer to the people by these methods or programs, I tell you by the grace of God, we will see wonderful things in Jesus' name. There are other, other that I can't talk about now. We have multi-site, multi-site church planting. We have seeker-based church planting. We have ministry evangelism-based church planting design. And with all the references there, but the time is far spent. Uh, we have another one I'd like just to mention is parachute drop-based parachute. You are dropped like you are dropped from a parachute. Just drop you there and say, go ahead, preach the gospel, and plant a church. Amen. And I tell you, Daddy has done that several no. That's how deeper life came up. By the grace of God, a father and the Lord will, can just call you, pray for you, and then you and your wife and family, you send it to a nation, it will tell you, go and open up the place. And the places were opened up. That's how we have the thousands in Africa today. It's not because there was not, something on ground, it's from zero. That we started from nothing and we become something today. I tell you, as we also obey and we are parachuted to various places we are going to be parachuted to, we will start the work and the work will grow in Jesus' name. Say it louder, amen. amen. Now, church planting, church planting, we have been talking about what kind of church we are planting. Let's read, read Acts chapter 2. Before I run off, Acts chapter 2, please, let's look at verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, in verse 42, this is what is written in the word of God. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and what? And in prayers. That's the church. That's the church. That's the church. Look at verse 46. And they continue daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. That's the church. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church, finish it, daily, such as it should be said. That's the church. Now we see in summary. That kind of church that we ought to plant is right there. Number one, it should be a church for worship. That's magnification. They continue self as an apostle doctrine and in, in, in fellowship. That's worship. Magnification. If that church doesn't do that, magnifying the Lord and worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness, that's not the church. Number two, they continue in fellowship. That's membership magnification the membership number three discipleship discipleship because they too were taught and they began to do the will of god in number four 
ministry, 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 ministry. Number one, magnification. Number two, membership. Number three, discipleship or maturity. Maturity. And number three, ministry, ministry. Number four, mission, evangelism, mission, mission. The two began to preach the gospel and God was adding to them as many as ordained for salvation. Point number three, just in five minutes I have left, product of successful saturation church planting. Product, product. What will happen by the grace of God if we plant churches as the Lord will lead us with prayer, with planning, with faith? What will the Lord do? What will happen? Habakkuk chapter 2, we read verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Finish it. As the waters cover the sea. That's what will happen. The knowledge of the Lord will fill the whole earth. And when the knowledge of the Lord fills the whole earth, then the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will be extinct. And by the grace of God, we will see this happen in our own time in Jesus' name. Let's have a louder amen. amen. And finally, now let me just take this Revelation chapter 7. Let's read verse 9 and 10. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. And I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. Of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and psalms in their hands and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb. The whole world could say, could echo, could sing this song because God Almighty has redeemed souls from all nations of the earth because all nations of the earth have been reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ and also have received churches in all their neighborhood. That would be the end product of saturated church planting. Product of successful saturation church planting activities. We will, we will see this by the grace of God in Jesus name. I want us to rise up to pray. No other time to read other references. Let's just stand up and pray and commit ourselves to the hand of the Lord. The models, the strategies won't work by themselves. Human beings are needed to work upon these strategies. They are to pray, they are to plan, they are to strategize where to go. Strategies are okay, but human beings will make use of strategies. This is Strategy Leadership Congress, by the grace of God. We are learning strategies of how to move out. Let's pray the Lord God will help us, strengthen us with grace, strengthen us with power, helping us by the grace of God to move on. That what the Lord God Almighty designed to happen in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 but that was ended by the sin of Adam the last Adam the Lord Jesus Christ the firstborn among the dead brought to pass through the church the nation that will bear the fruit of the kingdom and so the whole earth eventually will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. Let's pray, O oh God Almighty, find me usable in this time in the name of Jesus Christ. Help me, O oh Lord, so that I can see what I'm supposed to see. Give me, O oh Lord, the grace and the strength and the power to go out and preach the gospel and plant churches. Let's not, brothers and sisters, discourage church planting. What we have learned in this message is just a summary. You know, the, all we have been taught in this church, church planting is not new at all. We have heard it over and over again, Bible studies upon Bible studies. This is just to remind us that there's work yet to be done. That we have not saturated the neighborhood with churches. And if you're a district coordinator, this is your time. If you're a group coordinator, group pastor, this is your time. Regional overseers, this is our time. State overseers, national overseers, wherever the Lord God is placing you, this is your time. Multiply. Go into all the world. It says, be fruitful and multiply. And replenish the earth and subdue it. We pray, nothing will hinder us. 
by the grace of God that all the problems militating against church planting, the Lord God Almighty will destroy in the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord God will take them away. Nothing will stop you from planting church. Unbelief will not stop you. Let's remember to set aside part of our budget for church planting. We we'll set aside money to buy things. That's okay. To build campground, to buy cars, to make locomotion easy. That's all right. To do some other good, good things in the church. But what about church planting? This is not something we can just have us that lay down. Otherwise, we will disappoint God. And at the end of the day, we will disappoint his anointed servant too. We will not disappoint. He will not disappoint. Let's pray that the problems are removed. Problems of misconstruction, misunderstanding of the divine purpose of church planting. When we misunderstand the purpose and we approach the assignment in the flesh, we might see church planting as a knife aimed at a beefy authority and swelling purse. Oh, we might think, oh, if I plant churches now, my authority will be reduced. I'm not going to have much more control over the new churches. You don't have the mind of Christ. If you think like that, you are placed there. And you are placed there to reproduce, to do the will of God, to let Christ be known. Pray the Lord God will give you understanding. Removing the problem of misconception. Misconception. Wrong idea. Of how to evangelize the world. Preaching only in the cities. Putting churches among the rich. That's alright. But about the poor in the villages. God does not discriminate brothers and sisters. Between souls. Souls are souls. Whether educated or illiterate. Whether in the village or in the city. Souls are souls. Misconception. Change your mind. Pray the Lord God will give you the right perception misperception God will remove the problem of misperception God will give you right perception of church planting because you see sometimes opposition to church planting is fueled by our wrong perception of how vast the world's harvest fields are we think that this church is big enough why is that saying we should see go up we have good church. We are flourishing. God is opening doors and things are happening. And we are happy to be together here on this mount of transfiguration. Oh, but many, many souls are dying. And if Deeper Life Bible Church has remained in flat two, you and I probably may not be here. We may not even be in the kingdom. But the Lord God raised his servant and we, the church went out to all the nations in Africa and the cities and towns and that's how you got how, how the church got you and that's how you came to the kingdom pray the lord god will give you the right perception and all the leaders you lead all your workers we also have the same mind the same perception about church growth the problem of mismanagement we fear that these workers will mismanage will not do fine will destroy the standards they will not if they are born again and sanctified and they have been in the church for five years and six years, who tells you that they cannot pastor a church that's just 25, 30 people, six years in the Polar Bible Church. All the Bible studies, trained, trained, finished articles. And then we are saying they can't, they, we are afraid, no fear. As we come for retraining and retraining and retraining, and we receive more injections of anointing, they will stand, they will hold the church. Let's not mistrust them. Let's not misappropriate the budget. Let's also not misapply the Great Commission to only confining it to only the rich, the cities. What about the villages? What about the illiterate, those who don't understand grammar, those who don't speak English, but they understand Yoruba language, Igbo, Hausa, Kanuri, and so on. People group evangelism. When are we going to restore that? To the villages. Because Jesus preached in the villages. Peter preached in the villages. Evangelism is not just preaching here and there. It is a series of events that result in mature churches. 
If we preach the gospel, God gives us converts. What about churches? To disciple them. Let's pray the Lord God will help us. We will not lose the sight of these things. By the grace of God, we will be fruitful. We will plant churches. Wherever you find yourself, there is no excuse. Foreign land, homeland, the cities and towns and villages. Preach and plant churches. Sit back, pray, make survey, wait upon the Lord. Choose one of the models that suit you. We can't read all the models. We can't. There are so many models, so many strategies. But we know these things. We've been planting churches in the past. This is just to remind us of the things we have been taught and trained in. Sit back, make selection among the models, and get going. The Lord God Almighty is with us. We will pray. We will plan. Praying the Lord God will give you the heart. It was read to us in the morning. Ask of me the Eden. Ask. Ask. All those people in your neighborhood. All those uh, sinners. Those who are rebellious. Those who don't want to hear church. Ask of me the Eden. Ask. They are there. That God Almighty will just open. We just open the door. Take their hearts. And then give you opportunity to preach, to get converts, and to plant churches there. Develop a vision for it, brothers and sisters. Let church planting evangelism be your sleeping and waking thought. Don't sleep until you have thought about it. Develop a vision of it. Define church planting. Focus group. Where are you going? You don't know, it's just going and say, you go and divide there, divide there, divide there. If you do that, that's deception. And then you're writing reports, we're planting 60 churches. That's deception. That's deception. The churches are not well planted. No preaching took place. No program took place. And they are just placed here and there without justification. We are planting purpose through church. Determine. Tell the Lord to make us strong this year. Strong on the harvest field. And sickness in health, you just get going. And we are preaching and we are praying and we are getting churches planted. You and I we line up behind a dad in the law. We simply line up. As it goes up and down, we also go up and down. Nobody's resting, nobody's leaning on the fence and snoring and sleeping, sitting in the fold to hear the sound, the music of the shepherd. And saying it's good for us to build three things here. No, we are in the field. In the trenches, serving souls, discipling them, determining this year. And the Lord God will help you. To limit the outreach. That means concentrate on unreached people to plant the church. Pray the Lord God will give you, will lead you to the place. No time for us to see. You'll have seen Paul when he went out on the second missionary journey. The Holy Ghost led him. Led him. To the place to Macedonia, come over to Macedonia and help us. That's a, that's a, that's the result of prayer. If we pray also, as we are told to pray this morning, I tell you, the Holy Ghost will lead us, will show us where to go. Without the Holy Spirit, all strategies are just bookwork. They're just exercise in intellectualism. They won't work. Without Bible-based. Outrage. Strategies won't work. Strategies don't plan churches. Men do. Men. You and me. Going out. Doing the work in the day. At night. Without rest. We must plan churches. We will do it. Declare the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom. You preach Christ crucified. Redemption by his blood. We've had the message. That's nothing to preach. But redemption by his blood. By grace are you saved. Through faith. It's a gift of God. We preach Christ crucified. Preach the gospel. Don't preach yourself. Don't go out and show off. That you can do something. You know how to speak. You've gone to school. You've been trained. That's all nonsense. Those things don't get souls born again. Preach Christ crucified. Redemption 
by his blood. Disciple the converts in the local church. Don't transfer the converts to the central church that's 10, 12 kilometers away. And you're making an announcement. Come to our central church for discipleship training. And it's about 20 kilometers to the city. And villagers want them to come there. Transportation becoming difficult. Go there where they are. Start the church there. And disciple them right there on the spot where the sinners are. And of course, as we disciple them, my brothers and sisters, we, dis we deploy them also. As we were trained and deployed, so also we train them and deploy them to go and preach the gospel. We can split existing churches. We can split existing regional structures with permission from our daddy. We can split. In fact, we should split. That's the only way to bring growth. We have to restructure. God did some restructuring in the scripture. When Adam, when Adam and Eve fell, God had to restructure. Because his plan and purpose must be fulfilled. And so Jesus had to come to fill the whole earth with godly seed to fulfill the original plan of God. The Lord will help us. The Lord will help us. We will not just be hearers only. Hearing all these teachings, all these messages from the apostle, and then going out and doing nothing. That will not be our behavior. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Let's say it louder, amen. amen. I want us to make a commitment as we heard there, closing our eyes and say out before the presence of the Lord, I will preach. I will preach. I will plant churches. I will pray. I will pray. I will produce disciples. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Let's just put our hands together as we pray together now. Our two hands up. That's a symbol of total surrender to the will of God for this hour. Mighty Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, O oh Lord, for all that you have taught, taught us since we came. And this little drop in the ocean of the things you still have for us. We know, O oh Lord, one of the indications that we are transformed, a transformed life, is that we bear fruit. Is that we, we, we preach. Is that we radiate Christ, the glory of the Lord. We count for Christ. Lord, we pray all the problems obstructing church planting in our localities, in our states and nations. Lord, remove them in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy Father, we pray that as you have anointed us here, and you'll see re-anointing and re-anointing us. We pray, O oh Lord, as we go out, as we march out of this barrack on Saturday, Lord, we pray, a mighty army will storm Africa. Yeah. A mighty army will storm this nation. Yeah. Lord, we pray from coast to coast, from corner to corner, from village to village, from town to town, from city to city, we will fully preach the gospel and plant churches in the name of Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray, re-anoint and refresh and refill us so we can refire in Jesus' name. Lord, we want to bless you for this church. We want to bless you for this new drive, new focus. Lord, we pray, we will not disappoint you. And at the end of this year, we will come back to glorify your name. We will say, Sir, everything is doubled. Everything is doubled. Churches are doubled. Numbers are doubled. Holiness increased. Disciples multiplied. All over the nations where deep alive is, Lord, we pray. This will be a testimony in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let's say louder. Amen.